All right, good morning. Thank you for uh, coming to our morning session sponsored by Sky. Uh, we're talking about uh, secondary prevention uh, after cardio cardiovascular events. And, uh, you know, when we go to these interventional meetings, we're very, uh, very keen to listen to the latest technology, the devices. And, uh, you know, the reality is that, um, you know, the, the average interventional cardiologist um, you know, still sees patients three days a week in clinic, at least, and that al although we may be occasionally more fortunate to be in the lab all the time, uh, the, the vast majority of interventional cardiologists still take care of their patients afterwards. And unlike surgeons and interventional radiologists, uh, we have some role in taking care of their, of their secondary risk, of their risk factors and ensuring a good clinical outcome afterwards. So this, uh, the theme of this, this session is taking care of the whole patient, essentially. And uh, just, this is our agenda. I'm going to be going over briefly the uh, recent updates in the primary and secondary prevention of coronary artery disease. Uh, we are happy to have Naomi Hamburg from the Boston Medical Center, a specialist in vascular biology. She'll be talking about the emerging role of PSK9 for primary and secondary CAD prevention. We have Raghava Balagetti from the Boston VA uh, going over the clinical outcomes for the PSK9 inhibitors. And then uh, Subhash Banerjee, who needs no introduction, and he'll be discussing exploratory cholesterol reduction methods in the post-PCI setting. And then following that, we'll have a good uh, opportunity for case discussion and uh, see exactly where these drugs uh, uh, play a role in our armamentarium. So to start off, uh, I just want to go over the recent updates in the primary and secondary prevention of CAD. These are my disclosures. Um, this was actually recently published just last year, last fall, uh, by the ACC, AHA, everybody. Uh, and it has some changes from what we might have expected. You know, recall that the ATP no longer exists and everything has been uh, shifted over from the NIH just to the societies and uh, these are the results. Uh, th this is the template for the primary prevention, and you know most of us who are cardiologists don't see these patients, but we may have these questions asked of us. And, uh, and basically, anyone who's age 40 to 75 with an LDL of 70, uh, greater than 70, without diabetes, then you should be taking a 10-year ASCVD risk, uh, risk assessment. You have an online calculator, which takes all of these uh, risk factors, including uh, family history, chronic kidney disease, metabolic syndrome, and you come up with a calculation. If someone is low risk, then you emphasize lifestyle and risk factor reduction. If someone's borderline risk, then you have uh, you consider moderate intensity statin therapy. If someone's intermediate risk, then consider a statin, including moderate intensity statin, uh, or greater than 20%. If they're high risk, then initiate statin high dose to reduce LDL greater than 50%. Apart from this group, if anyone has diabetes, you should initiate moderate intensity statin. And if someone has a very high LDL, then try a high, dense, high intensity statin up on the upper right. We're dealing more in the cardiology sphere with a secondary prevention where someone's already had clinical ASCVD, someone with coronary disease or angina, PAD. Uh, if everybody should be approached with a, approach for a lifestyle modification, of course. If someone is not at very high risk, and I'll go over those definitions later, then at age less than 75, you still should have a high intensity statin, typically Lipitor uh, 40 to 80 or Crestor 20 to 40. And if high intensity statin is not tolerated, use a moderate intensity statin. For the elderly, there is some data to suggest that a moderate intensity statin is sufficient and maybe a high intensity statin is not necessary, and that's what those yellow bars are. For those patients with very high risk of ASCVD, then everybody should be on a high intensity or maximal statin. And if their LDLC is still greater than 70, then adding a Zetia uh, is reasonable. And if a PSK9, if, if, the, if the LDL is still high, uh, especially above 70, uh, then the, adding a PSK9 is reasonable. Class 2A uh, with level of evidence uh, A. So just going over the moderate and difference between moderate and high intensity statin, as I mentioned, a torvastatin 40 to 80 or vasubastatin 20 to 40 is the high intensity statin and everything else is um, only moderate intensity. This is the most critical slide and identifies um, who, who's at the highest risk for ASCVD events. And the people who have these events, of course, are the ones who already had one, a recent ACS within 12 months, a history of MI, history of ischemic stroke, or symptomatic peripheral artery disease with a history of claudication with an abnormal ABI, or certainly anyone who's had previous revascularization or amputation. Other high-risk conditions and factors include age greater than 65, uh, FH, prior cabbage, diabetes, hypertension, CKD, current smoking, L persistently elevated LDL or history of congestive heart failure. So these are the patients that we deal with on a daily basis. We have the high-risk patients, so we should be considering these uh, aggressive interventions that are non-statin.
Uh, so to summarize some of these, these recommendations in, in terms of the level of evidence, again, secondary ASCVD prevention in patients who are 75 years of age or younger, high intensity statins should be initiated with the goal of reducing the LDL by 50%. If you had side effects, then you can use a moderate intensity statin. For the same group, if you have, uh, if they are considered to have, considered, who are considered to be high risk and are considered for PSK9 inhibitor therapy, then you should use high intensity statin and Zetia. And this is what we see from the insurance companies already anyway. Basically, before you even consider it a uh, PSK9 inhibitor, you should also be on Zetia based on the Improve It trial that I'll go over later. In patients who are judged to be very high risk and still on, uh, on Zetia and statin, then a patient discussion should occur about the net benefits, safety, and costs of a PSK9 inhibitor. Uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the unique thing about these guidelines, and not, it's never been seen in any other guidelines, for the first time, the societies have added a value statement to the PSK9 inhibitors. They said at, at the mid-2018 list prices, PSK9 inhibitors have a low cost value, or greater than $150,000 per quality of adjusted life year, compared to good cost value, less than $50,000 per quality of adjusted life year. So at the cost of $14,000 a year, these PSK9 inhibitors were judged to have low value. And you know, this is the first time any, any guideline has actually even considered cost. And I think that, that, that was something quite remarkable. And let's go over that a little further. Before I do that though, for those patients with actual FH, LDL greater than 190, then a PSK9 inhibitor may be considered. These are level of evidence 2B, uh, sorry, recommendation 2B because these patients are less uh, well studied and has uncertain value at 2018 list prices. So here's the one slide that I think was, illustrates this the best. Uh, the, current, the prior cost before October of uh, the PSK9 inhibitor was about $14,000, both alirubumab from Regeneron and Evolocum Lab from Amgen. And this is an estimate of the cost effectiveness from their own, their own trials of, the, of, the, uh, of atherosclerotic events. And the, uh, the feeling was that at the willingness to pay level of 50,000, uh, the cost of evolocumab was, uh, had a poor cost value. At the level of 150000 then if the drug cost was reduced to $6,000, then perhaps half of the patients would actually have an optimal outcome by being on the drug. So your willingness to pay threshold, as well as the cost of the drug, determines whether something is cost effective or not. So too often we say, oh, this drug is cost effective, this one's not. But the reality is, it might be cost effective for this one patient who's high, very high risk, but it's not cost effective in this other patient who is lower risk, if that makes sense. Uh, it seems obvious in retrospect, but it's not necessarily described as such in our literature. So what's the natural result? Well, they were not getting much traction from the, on these PSK9 inhibitors despite being available and having good cl clinical outcome studies. So Amgen and Regeneron both reduced their cost from 14000 a year to a net of $5,800 uh, per year. And that's just the list price. The net costs of patients can range as little as $25 monthly out of pocket or to $150 if you're a, a, a Medicare patient. They also negotiated with uh, uh, insurance companies to uh, improve access, including doing some unique things such as value-based contracts where they said, if this patient has an MI, we'll, we, will, you know, we, we will cover the cost of the drug and, and give it to you for free. They've been very creative. So going back to this slide again, if you move this bar down, now down to $5,800, you see that uh, more and more patients would meet that cost effectiveness threshold. Uh, traditionally, we use the $50,000 threshold because that was the cost of uh, dialysis back in the 60s. But the reality is dialysis these days costs eighty dollars to $90,000. And the true willingness to pay of the healthcare system is probably closer to $100,000 rather than $50,000. So I would amend the guidelines to say that at the willingness to pay threshold of 100,000 and that the cost of evolocumab of 5,800, roughly 40% of patients would probably have an optimal outcome to have uh, this drug added to their regimen. Just to go over some evidence, we, we, many of you are familiar with the Improve It trial. Adding Zetia actually did lower the LDL by 16 milligrams per deciliter on average and actually reduced the MACE rate. So it, although it's a modest reduction, it is a reduction. So on top of statin, adding uh, Zetia is effective, and that's, that went into the guidelines. 
Something new that is also uh, being explored is this new drug, bempedoic acid, which reduces LDL by 19, um, makes per deciliter or 16%. This was just published in the New England Journal and the Clear Harmony trial. Uh, there's no al clinical outcome events, though, from this trial. So uh, this company is already approaching uh, uh, some of us to, to start educating, and they're going to have FDA approval potentially as early as next year. And then uh, one thing that, uh, that we should also consider are those patients who have high triglycerides. Um, in this trial, the reduce it EPA trial, uh, the use of icosapent ethyl uh, did reduce um, LDL by, uh, sorry, did reduce uh, triglycerides by 18% and redu reduce MACE by up to 25%. The, the clarity of this is, is clouded by the negative results of other trials of fish oil, uh, but in this study at least it was positive. So that's something else that we can consider. So take home messages from the guidelines, and this is from the ACC directly. Um, the, in patients with clinical ASCVD reduce LDL uh, with high intensity statin therapy or maximally tolerated statin therapy and use a goal uh, LDL reduction of 50%. In, very patient, in patients with very high risk of ASCVD, use an LDL threshold of 70 milligrams a deciliter to consider the addition of non-statins to statin therapy. Most of these patients should be having a Zetia attached to them. And then in patients with very high risk whose LDL remains above 70 on both a statin and Zetia, adding a PSK9 inhibitor is reasonable and potentially reasonably cost-effective. And those are the patients we have to start identifying as those who would benefit most. And it turns out those patients are our patients.